Welcome to Café Rollist, the second episode in our series dedicated to Road to Session Zero Con, the convention uh, taking place in the Philippines, but online, so anyone can take part. And today I'm joined by another participant. Uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Aki. I'm a freelance adventure writer from RPGC. Uh, I write adventures about fairy tales, and I just love sharing uh, Southeast Asian culture w when I write. Brilliant. So this show, Café Rolis, is sort of a spin-off born out of the the first lockdown. We are at lockdown three here in London, but we got a couple ice-breaking questions uh, which were inspired by the situation. Uh, what is your routine like at the moment? Is it impacted by the lockdown or other of the many world events taking place recently? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, here in the Philippines, we've been on what we call the ECQ or Enhanced Community Quarantine. So that's the name for it. Um, so we haven't actually gone back to normal ever since March. So a lot of places are still closed down. Public transport is kind of wonky as of now. Uh, normally, I'm a figure skater. I just graduated university, actually, and I'm a figure skater. So my days used to consist of um, going to the rink in the morning and then going to classes and then going back to the skating rink. But now um, it's, we're not, it's considered an entertainment sport. So the, we are not allowed to go out and train yet. So we're all just back. Um, stuck in our house so we haven't gone back to that ever so a day in the life for me right now would be um, wake up go to work um, after work's done I have a few D&D games that I participate in or I DM and then after that you know I stream sometimes with my friends and back to sleep <laughs> very exciting is figure skating uh, somewhat popular in the Philippines because uh, I'm afraid we tend to have always this blanket stereotype about uh, East Asia and uh, figure skating is rarely features in that. So is that a popular sport uh, in your area? Well, in Southeast Asia, we we do love figure skating. We're, out, we're trying our best. Um, we In Manila, there's only two, there are only two major rinks. The first one is in SM Mega Mall. And then the second one is really, really far away for me because I live in uh, the city. It's in a whole different city, actually, um, which is bigger. And that's where our hockey team trains. So we actually do have hockey teams. Uh, we went up against Malaysia and Indonesia in the Southeast, uh, the ASEAN Games. Um, so it, it's fairly popular, I guess. Most Filipinos see it as more of a kind of a date type experience since the rinks are open year round since they're indoor. Um, a lot of people take their dates there or they take the kids out. As a sport, it's kind, it's a little bit difficult. It's a bit pricey. Um, so not a lot of people go out uh, to skate as sport, but they do go out for entertainment. So it's always full. Our rinks are always full. Uh, we the last time I went ice skating, I think in all my life I went like twice, maybe three times ice skating, and the last time was sort of a, a date uh, for me and my wife, and we found out that we were actually terrible. <laughs> it was really not romantic. It just felt dangerous to us. It was uh, at Somerset House. They set up a, a nice rink uh, in normal circumstances as part of the the Christmas and the the holidays, and that. Uh, but it's a uh, it's a very nice setting to to do so. I'm just sort of afraid whether when my son will be into that. That uh, yeah, it won't exactly be like in the American movies. Or I won't be there to teach him hockey or anything like that. Did you pick surprisingly up? Surprisingly, really good at figure skating. <laughs> Great, well, good to hear. Yeah. Think what for me it would be more slapstick comedy. Did you pick up any new interest or hobby uh, since the beginning of uh, all those lockdowns or your single lockdown? Um, well, actually, yeah, uh, I started writing adventures. <laughs> I only started playing D&D &D, uh, last December, December 2019. So uh, I just passed my first anniversary playing. Wow. And I started writing in June 
and I got published in June as well, the end of June. Um, and it's been just kind of a huge adventure since then. Really crazy, actually. Like I had at the start, I had no idea I'd be in this position where I am right now, and I'm super grateful for the D and D community and like RPGC. Everyone is so kind and so welcoming, and everyone gives really, really great tips especially in my weak areas like writing encounters is particularly difficult for me but I get so much good advice online like Twitter is amazing it's been a great resource it's nice to hear Twitter is a nice place because <laughs> recently <laughs> there were there was a, quite a bit of discord saying uh, uh, the opposite I think it's uh, it depends of everyone's uh, oh, something happening on my computer uh, experience so uh so how did you make the jump from, first of all, starting a game a year ago and already writing an adventure and having it published? How did you make that decision to have this happen? Well, when I started, I was really apprehensive. I was really scared, um, to be honest. Like, I would be like extra prepared with all of my stuff and starting... Um, sessions would run really long but as time progressed I kind of got more relaxed with role playing I got a little bit more into DMing the first time I ever dungeon mastered I was so nervous I had weeks of prep so much notes like notebook pages full only to have it all fall apart in the first few minutes by my players that's kind of when I learned like a lot of DMing. It's also a lot of improv. Um, you take, you just take it as is and you roll with the punches and it, it becomes more fun that way rather than trying to be really rigid about it. Um, I did the RPG Writers Workshop where I met some amazing Southeast Asian artists like Isaac. Isaac Mandagi, he um, wrote, he writes Cthulhu based um, adventures uh that's where i met him and he invited me over to um dex which was an indonesian con and i met a lot of other southeast asian players and writers and it was really cool so they kind of right the rpg writers workshop just kind of catapulted me into the whole writing scene but it's really more of the community that kind of kept me like hey you know what there's this collab that we want to do like, come on, come over. We have some a project that we want to hear about. Like, it was really cool. Everyone, everyone's kind of very inspiring in that sense. So I'm gonna put on the the cover for people to see of uh, Midsummer Night Scream. So it's your first uh, published yeah. material. Uh, what is it about? So Midsummer Night Scream is actually a one of well, Midsummer Night Scream is one of my favorite Shakespearean plays. It's got a lot of chaos in it, which my friends, uh, my players, and those who DM me know this kind of chaos is kind of my brand. Um, so the adventure deals with Lex, who is this uh, love-struck farm boy, and he goes on an adventure to help please the girl that he wants to go on a date with. So along the way, he finds out that things aren't always as they seem in love and a lot of chaos can come up when trying to force something that's not really perfect for you. And it's a, it's a level one, level two, three, four, five adventure, or can any level pick up uh, that one? Well, any level can pick it up. It's one of it's written in the style that um, it's kind of an in between what I call it, like an in between game. So it's a good introductory game for level one players, but at the same time, it's something that a party can do in between like long uh, sessions. So for example, if you guys are on a campaign and you just want to pick up something light and funny and um, not very serious, it's a good way to kind of take a break in between very serious campaigns. And uh, what has been the, the feedback like uh, so far when, when you published this? Did you advertise it a lot? and? Uh... Was it picked up by, by anyone? Uh, did you receive uh, uh, messages from people running it? Uh, what was this experience like? Uh, so when I published it, 
I didn't know a lot about how to market it or how to market myself actually. Um, so there wasn't that big of a reception, um, but people seem to really enjoy it. One of the things that they tell me is that they really love the NPCs that I've created. They kind of come to life and they have their own personalities. Um, the farm boy that you guys, that the party is supposed to travel with is one of the NPCs that I get a lot of feedback that he's very sweet, he's very homely, um, he's very honest. So he kind of taps into that urge to protect him from all of these uh, devious people who are trying to betray him or trick him or deceive him in any way. Um, there's also a really interesting discourse there about love potions in general. So we take I took um, a, an item called the filter of love and created a lesser version of it. So it talks about consent actually when using love potions and of course, we also talk about the briefing and all that sort of all those safety tools when we're playing um, MKC because it deals with love potions. And so this is one way to help players and DMs communicate with each other. What are the limits and how it also teaches DMs how to play within those limits that uh, the players are comfortable with. Yeah, it's a uh, charm person and all this type of spell definitely have taken a, a different... Uh, there, there's been a, a lot of discussion regarding what, what they actually meant, although they, they were very classical tropes. And uh, and actually the title of your, your adventure is quite a, a good reference to all, all this trope is. I mean, it goes back to the at least ancient Greece for at least Western culture, but... Uh, a Midsummer Night's Dream is all about uh, the the use and abuse uh, of love potions. Uh, are there are there things? I mean, I find it interesting that you wrote something inspired by uh, Shakespeare, uh, who of course uh, is known well beyond the the boundaries of uh, western Western countries. Uh, how did you sort of had the two come together, your own culture and this influence, which is Anglo-Saxon, uh, if you will. Uh, what, what's your, what is it like being in the Philippines and uh, hearing of Shakespeare and uh, taking that influence uh, with, with all its baggage and do something with it? So um, when I wrote this, so, well, we do study Shakespeare in high school and in university. It's part of our required curriculum. Um, but what I did to make it a bit closer to my own culture was to bring in the importance of community into it. So Philippine culture is, um, it's not, it's people, uh, it's, a, it's a very collectivist culture. We use the term collectivist. So we're very, we have very strong bonds with um, our community. So that's kind of what I wanted to put into Midsummer Night's Cream that idea of community and the strength of who um, the party is and how they build this bond with Lex, the farm boy. And that kind of bond and the idea of that community and trying to protect one another is what I wanted to put into Midsummer Night's Cream as well. So uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, you consider that you you sort of struggle with encounters, and it's and do you like chaos? Uh, encounters seem to me uh, very central to Dungeons and Dragons. So why was it Dungeons and Dragons and not uh, another system which would maybe would be more fitting to to th those themes and tropes? Well, I wanted to challenge myself first of all, like. And Dungeons and Dragons, it's just very um, classic in a sense. You know, you have the three, um, the three E's of the three pillars, and I wanted to be able to learn how to write an effective encounter while maintaining that flow of the story and you know making it fun for everyone involved. So not just a pure role play, not just purely exploration, but also just try to up the challenge factor. Mainly, my problem is balancing the encounters, making sure they're not too difficult for my players, and making sure it's not too easy as well. It's a little bit challenging. Um, so recently, I asked on Twitter, 
what about the challenge ratings? You know, the, the challenge ratings that they give us um, when we look up beasts. And the thing is, a lot I got a lot of feedback uh, regarding that, how it wasn't useful, but there are also some people who are saying, oh, it's in how you read the rules and how you apply them that make it easier to create these encounters. Or some people were like, oh, I just use it as a base and then I change all of these things. I change the elements and other people were like, you know what, just do what you want and kind of adjust it on the fly. So I guess when it comes to writing adventures, you want to give options for your DMs. Um, for example, you know, you write a uh, funny story. I accidentally once wrote in 54 blink dogs for an encounter and sent it to my publisher before noticing. And she comes back and she goes, Aki, 54 blink dogs? I'm like, oops, I, I guess, I guess not. Maybe not 54, maybe five. I'm not a uh, DMs Guild writer myself, I have no experience there. So what are the three pillars uh, actually? So you have your exploration, your combat, and your um, your communication or your role playing. Um, so that's uh, how you get to interact with your environment, the challenges that your environment can bring for you, your encounters, which are of course the combat situ uh, situations, and then you have your role playing. And you know that's how you interact with the world and how you interact with one another. So those are the three really important parts of what makes an adventure an adventure at least classically. Now we have more varied types of adventures. We have ones that are more role play heavy now. We have ones that are just dungeon crawls, you know, a variety to suit whoever kind of wants to play what. Were there adventures uh, that you, you, you looked, lo that you still look up to, which you find especially well written, uh, that you are, you are like, oh, one day I will write something as good uh, as this. Uh, did you have time within a year to to familiarize yourself with uh, some classics or things that yourself consider classics? Right now, I'm actually playing Descent into Avernus, and Descent into Avernus is so beautifully, it's fun, it's difficult. It makes you take, it makes you try to choose um, between really difficult decisions, which is great. Uh, it's kind of draining at times because, you know, it's emotionally heavy and psychologically it's meant to be difficult. But it's, I find the way that they write these moral encounters really interesting and kind of wants, it pushes the player's boundaries. It definitely, like, pushes how far a player will go for the character or, you know, say, okay, this is enough. I can't, I can't handle this um, situation anymore. Another one would be Riddle of the Raven Queen, which is an older adventure written for 5e. Um, I really enjoyed the way it was written. It was, it's a very roleplay heavy book in general. Um, there are a lot of scenarios, again, that instead of having a lot of combat, what it does is it uses the parts of a character sheet that we don't normally look at, like the personality traits, the bonds, the flaws. While those are important in like the backstory and building our characters, we don't normally exploit them when it comes to the actual running of adventure. So you don't normally see a book say, oh, look at the personality traits of the character and um, use this to build the encounter or use this to create the scenario. So in Riddle of the Raven Queen, they're actually kind of important in creating the adventure. So I, I really like that it kind of mixes it up a little bit. So I try to incorporate, I try to remember and incorporate as much of the character sheet as I can in the book. So it's not just relying on roles or um, combat, but it also picks up these little bits that books tend to look over. To just yeah. make it a more well-rounded adventure. I'm not very good with system mastery myself, so it might be already in the the PHB, but uh, I'm often frustrated with the lack of use of the bonds, the background, and, and so on. Uh, and I'm always thinking that should I go back at trying to to dungeon master fifth edition, uh, I'd probably make horse rules, and they might not be horse rules, but make it so that you gain inspiration each time you activate one of those 
in your role play or whatever happens or what you do uh, at, at the table because uh, yeah the, the the dungeon masters i played with they tended to be not exactly reluctant but uh they tended to forget that inspiration points were there and i, I thought it was a pity yeah. to to encourage more stuff and reward the sort of behavior you'd like to see at the table so Definitely bringing up uh, backgrounds, bonds, and so on uh, is something which would be nice mechanically. And uh, if there are adventures which do that, uh, that's that's really awesome, I think. Yeah, so for me personally, as a DM, I always reward creativity. I love seeing how creative a solution can my players come up with. So one time I ran a maze and I, you know, your expectation for your characters is to either run the maze or try to do something weird. One of them actually decided to fly up and I didn't really expect that. I don't know why I didn't expect it, but they flew up and because of that, they were able to see the entire layout of the maze, which was brilliant. And, you know, in that sense, like, of course, why, why wouldn't you think of that? So because of that, they were able to get the entire maze layout. So we gave them the map for it, of course. And, you know, that they were calling the shots. They were like, okay, guys, you should go here. You should take a left here. The person you're chasing is over there. So it kind of made it more dynamic and they felt more in control of their own game, which was great. Um, another one, another group, on the other hand, instead of going through or trying to fly, they decided to use their dwarven companion as a battering ram <laughs> to go through the flimsy walls. I was like, okay, you may yeet the dwarf, but remember, he's going to take some damage doing so. And the dwarf just goes, go, throw me. It's like, okay, it's your choice. Uh, yeah. I mean that's 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 a trope in itself. The uh, you know in stories about games of D and D players or any type of role playing game really, uh, so players thinking just about the things which you did not consider and sort of could put yeah. down the your whole uh, your whole premise. Um, you were telling me uh, earlier that uh, you already have uh, another project in the work, and actually it's a, it's a collective project. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about this one? Yes, so currently I'm working with Transparent Games, who's run by this really awesome person, Anna. Um, so we're creating the LGBTQ anthology, which is a bunch of different stories, different angles, and different backgrounds of love and relationships in the LGBT community. And so we're writing different sorts of adventures. Everyone has their own take. Um, mine in particular, again, is inspired by a fairy tale um, and winter. So when it comes out, uh, we're going to raise a Kickstarter for it. And since it's an open system, it's one of those games that you can just pick up and play in any system that you want to really put it in. It's really exciting and I cannot wait for it to come out. We've got phenomenal writers on board. It's super exciting to be working on the project and being in the Discord, you can see it like progressing little by little and you know, seeing all of these different writers is really inspiring. Like, oh, um, so Sebastian has gotten their stuff ready. Or like, so you can, everyone kind of hypes each other up as well. So if you're stuck in a particular part of your story, you can reach out and go like, um, hey, I, I'm having a bit of a problem with like this part of my story. Can you help me out? And you know, someone is going to be there and uh, catch you and help you out with your question. It's I'm really excited about this anthology mainly because it's the first um, LGBT anthology that I'm a part of, and it's really important for me to be to help raise awareness and also kind of collect these stories. D and D in general, um, you can really change up certain aspects of the story, but having it like seriously written as an entire project, it's really nice to be able to show and be a part of. So, is it all system agnostic or just your adventure? They're all system agnostic. So, so what? 
was that a, a big change from uh, your first adventure? You, not having the encounters, but then uh, that means you, you lose a bit of... Uh, uh, when I engage in a creative process, I personally enjoy having a, a number of constraints, uh, a framework. Uh, it really helps me structure what I'm doing and encourage myself and justify my choices. So I imagine when you write something which is system agnostic, you sort of remove a lot of barriers, could be yeah. anything almost. So how did you structure your work? Uh, did it support your creativity or on the contrary, did it make things more difficult? I would say both. On one hand, I had more creativity to pull out anything that I wanted to you know, put in my book. Like I could write anything, any scenario that I wanted. On the other hand, I had to remember like, oh, okay, I can't use this because it's licensed material. Um, I had to create my own stat blocks for certain creatures and characters. So it's kind of that as much as I have the freedom to do anything that I really want to, I have to remember that, oh, okay, I'll be creating customized um, stats for these creatures or I'll have to be creating different names or different places because I can't use the ones that are uh, available in when you write for like D and D or any system really. Oh, so you did not even use creatures which are uh, again. I'm not a specialist uh, of SRD and D and D, uh, but you didn't use a uh, I don't know a displacer beast, a uh, yeah. what are they calling a beholder and this sort of things. Then no, we're not allowed to use um, those those creatures in particular. So I had to come up with my own, like kind of more or less from scratch. So that was a little bit tricky, but it's also fun because it's like a whole different exercise in itself. So aside from, you know, you're writing your own story, you're, you get to create more customized creatures that are just like a perfect fit for the adventure. So instead of like relying on like, for example, giant wolves or giant rats, this time I can create like an ice wolf or I can create a frost gnome from scratch, which is really fun. Well, at least you don't need stat blocks for them. So that's uh, that's a good, uh, the good thing, I guess. Uh, did the... Um... Did this experience make you want, first of all, uh, this new adventure you're writing, is it still sort of a medieval fantasy like D&D is, or is it going somewhere else? Uh, this one is still kind of medieval fantasy. You could put it maybe in a more advanced um, time period, but it's meant to be played in a medieval sort of fantasy world. It's definitely heavily influenced um, by Scandinavian folklore. Um, but there are also, I also put a lot of little secret references to um, different cultures in it. And another piece that I'm writing, actually, um, there are a lot more influences there for Philippine literature and Philippine uh, folklore. Oh, yet another project. Uh, can we yeah. hear a bit more about this one as well? Yes. Um, the second project is called Fated to Be. It's about a fairy wedding gone ro very, very wrong. So adventurers are hired to uh, by a wedding planner to come up and help um, this very famous couple who are getting married. But it seems that the families aren't very happy about it. So they, they're trying to break the couple up, but the couple are very much in love. So there are a lot of things that the players have to do. So it's a very replayable kind of adventure with a lot of different items. What's really fun is I got to come up with a bunch of different magic items, which is so exciting in itself. Um, and there are parts of them. For example, there's this part about the rainbow and the god creature that you need to talk to and encounter is called bahaghari so bahaghari in the filipino is rainbow it's literally a rainbow so in the philippine folklore um bahaghari created the rainbow and it's because of him that we have it so those are like parts of philippine folklore that i try to include 
um, also so that people get to know the gods and goddesses of Philippine literature and Philippine culture. A lot of them were taken away from us during uh, the Spanish colonization because they colonized us for like 333 years and they would burn native books and stuff like that. So we don't have a complete history, but we're trying to, you know, we're trying to reclaim it and we're trying to look for our own archeology span and preserve our own culture that we had pre-colonially. My brother actually wrote a book about uh, pre-colonial gods and goddesses in a fantasy setting of his own, which is really fun if you can find it. Um, what was it called? He... What is the title? I'm actually not very sure that this <laughs> published, but we did get to read it. Um, it. It was his thesis. So I think he's in talks uh, for it. But he talks of, because each, what's really interesting in the Philippines is we're composed of 7,107 islands and each cultural group. So we're not just one huge cultural Philippine group. We're a bunch of little cultures as well. Well, because of, you know, we're an archipelago. So being spread out, we kind of had our own cultures. There are hundreds, almost thousands of languages here in the Philippines alone. And each group had their own pantheon. So the moon goddess of one area is not necessarily like the moon goddess of another area. So there's so much you can explore, which is why projects like Sinauna are really amazing. Like you get to see different the Philippine culture, which is a very different culture from, let's say, Indonesian culture, um, Japanese culture, which were more main, which are more mainstream. So you get to see this whole new pantheon. Well, not new, but you see this pantheon that you haven't seen before, and they're really cool gods and goddesses. Like one of the co- one of the coolest practices pre-colonially that I know of is when you intend to marry someone. You take your family spear and then you throw it on the grounds of or in front of the house of the one you intend to marry to declare your intention. So that's a pre-colonial thing that you don't really see anymore, which is uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, that's a, cool, that's a cool tradition that you, you'll see. Uh, it would be cool to have that reintroduced as part of a role-playing game playing uh, playing out that culture or at least aspects of that culture and being part of that and uh, uh, being uh, confronted to it. I thought it was interesting that you mentioned the, the story of a, a somewhat famous couple, successful family and the family or at least people within the family are trying to keep them apart because again, it's, it's, it's both a story as old as humankind yeah. and stuff from ancient Greece uh shakespeare we have uh, several stories revolving around that and, and i was thinking uh, closer to us in time uh, and slightly geographically on, on your side uh that's kind of crazy rich asians in in singapore which <laughs> which is quite a further away uh from from the philippines but uh that would be quite cool as a picture crazy rich asians uh but with uh with face <laughs> yeah it's it kind of does have that tone. <laughs> What's really fun about that project is like I get to create so many different scenarios. Um, so there are encount- there's an encounter underwater where you where the players get to go uh, where their characters get to go underwater and fight like naiads and mermaids. Um, on the other hand, there's this one where they have to find a magic flower that acts like a bell to summon a creature cool in a forest full of flowers <laughs> there's another one where they get to go to a magic bazaar but with the bazaar they secretly they they start to lose their memories of why they're there the longer they stay so there's all these little kind of mini adventures um building up to this whole big adventure so there's a lot of and there are a lot of different scenarios so you can kind of dms can kind of pick and choose so there's a lot of replayability with it which is something i've this is the first time i'm trying to do a module like this actually 
interface, they, you find them in a, in a number of uh, IPs uh, and stories, including several contemporary ones. Uh, there are things like uh, Changeling or Urban Shadows, which has uh, characters either play Phase or uh, you, you've got booklets, you've got the option to play Phase. Phase um, in contemporary settings or, or other systems, are, the, are there some of these which interest you in terms of concept or, or system that you would consider writing or playing with? Hmm. I actually, I usually stray towards Genasi, the Genasi or Genasi and Elven um, roots. But in particular, when I was approached with this project, they were like, oh, we want you to write phase in the Feywild. We want it to be in the Feywild. So I had to research about the Feywild and there are actually a lot of interesting characters who are there. Baba Yaga from Slavic folklore is there. Um, you have, I. there are also interesting, um, there are a lot of interesting places since it's kind of a mirror of the material plane. So there's a lot more to explore, I think. And it's an ever-shifting, very magical realm. You know, we have, like, elves who are very close to nature that they've kind of changed and shifted, kind of the way the drow have evolved in the Underdark. You have the Eladrin who are more in tune with nature and they're more in tune. Like, their hair changes color um, with the seasons, which is really cool. So I, I had to build up from these bases and come up with kind of my own interpretation of fairies and fae from what the original SRD content was and kind of expand and basically create my own fae wild. Would I do it again? Maybe not so soon since I've, I'm kind of saturated at this point with a lot of um, fairy tales and fairyland kind of concepts. But I think it's a setting that uh, writers should consider more, especially if they want to have that huge chaotic magic adventure. Uh, my question was slightly a bit more about uh, moving out of the medieval fantasy in general and go to, towards more uh, contemporary or science fiction or maybe something like Shadowrun which is futuristic but you still have fantastical yeah. creatures uh, I mean in in general are there sort of uh, entertainment pieces you find especially you especially enjoy and you would like to to draw inspiration from or play with uh, uh, are there yeah what what what's your next thing uh, after that is it gonna be just oh I got enough of fairies but so I'm going to do elven or dwarves or are you, are you interested in going uh, even towards something different? Well, honestly, as a kid, like Lord of the Rings was a huge thing for me. So I'm very saturated <laughs> in the kind of fantasy world. Um, but I also do love cyberpunk. Cyberpunk is one of my favorite um, settings. Sci-fi. I love sci-fi. I'm a huge sci-fi fan. Like Ursula Le Guin's books are very inspirational. Um, there's a lot of <laughs> I have a lot of like special interest I love steampunk as well actually and I've written so far two pieces that are not for publication yet this is actually a pretty secret thing um, and exclusive for you guys I have in the works a a piece that's kind of steampunk related so no fantasy no magic rather it deals with well steampunk in a sense is kind of rather magical but more of a science based actually medical um series where no. you guys where players get to play as either soldiers or doctors in training and they as doctors in training they get to solve a mystery why their uh, director was suddenly abducted and it whole plays into this whole scheme of a war going on in a virus outbreak which was very unfortunately timed um this was written way before the 
coronavirus outbreak, but somehow ended up getting play tested during it. And my players were like, this hits a little bit close to home, Aki. I think this is a bit too close. Yeah, uh, my my last the last live event I attended, uh, we played some RuneQuest, um, and uh, the story there was sort of uh, I guess the the person running it was uh, it was Ian Cooper who's part of the writing team for RuneQuest, Glorenta, and HeroQuest, and I, I guess you know it's in the news. So before you're in the situation, he's already in the the zeitgeist. So he wrote and ran a stories revolving around a, a plague and uh, yeah it was uh it, it was probably the last weekend we could have played something like that i would have any taste uh, in playing this because now uh, it's uh it's way all too close to us uh we've got richard here from another podcast the d20 future show which i recommend people to check and he's got a question because if people are joining us uh via twitch they can ask questions and he's asking what is aki's workflow for writing an adventure do you start with an outline of the whole thing or do you usually have the the climax the big ending and you work your way back uh, from that do you have a uh, what's the aki's method towards a successful uh, adventure uh well hmm <laughs> what is my first what what's your secret <laughs> um actually the first thing i do is make a mind map. So Interesting. The original mind map for my adventure is actually behind me. Um, you wouldn't see it, but it's in a, a sketchbook right behind me. But when you say um, a map, is it a so sort of a narrative to... map of the story or is it a, a map of the, the geography where the story is going to take place? It's a narrative map. So okay. I have like the main idea in the center and then I build from there like okay, from this branch, who are my NPCs? What's my mood? What is What are the places I need to write about? Um, what are the conflicts and the BBEGs or the villains in my um, story? So from there, it just kind of arcs out. And then from that, I make the narrative outline. And then I just kind of fill it in from there. Uh, Richard is, uh, in rather strong terms, requesting that you show us uh, one of your <laughs> diagrams. Are they within uh, okay. the reach of your camera? Yes. Okay, fine. I, I, I will. <laughs> this is for you, Richard. Um, quite messy. Give me a second. I'm Let picturing me... something like for the fans of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, a Charlie situation with Pepe and yes, Sylvia. Yes, that's... <laughs> <laughs> so this is a small version of M I think MKC actually. So you can't really see the details, sorry about that, but we need um, to buy you big stiff this. pens. <laughs> easier to read. Yeah, that's why they're all pencil <laughs> because I change a lot of the details. Um so here in the center is like the main idea and then you can see like I've branched out and there's like a big important thing over here the final encounters the flow of it so i actually did programming a lot as a kid like computer programming so a lot of my flow charts still kind of look like in that logical flow <laughs> until now um even the outlines that like the one i showed you there are some parts of it that are actually just the narrative from the start to beginning like the flow of it with the decision boxes and everything. Um, so a lot of it starts like this, but sometimes I'll just get an idea and then I'll go straight for it. Um, another, I guess, genre that I really love, like I've mentioned it before, I love sci-fi. I've done a Star Trek themed game before, oh. which the system is uh, 2D20. So it wasn't the system I was very comfortable playing with at the time, mainly because I'd been playing 5e for the longest. So it's the usual um, die system. 2d20 had to be like, it was a reverse in a sense, where what you would want the lower numbers 
instead of a higher number. So it was really confusing at first. And there's a so, there's a token economy yeah. also. I mean, uh, it it happens that Star Trek Adventures is de is developed and published uh, here in London by Modifius. So I'm a bit familiar with with the team. And I, I've been running Star Trek, but with a previous game, not not that one. Mm -hmm. And uh, 2D20 is very interesting, but it's it's a bit too crunchy for me. It's not, it's not just a question yeah. of crunchy. It's very special. It's kind of in between things. And you got a token economy, which applies to the Game Master as well. It's it's a very interesting system, but it's not that easy. There's a lot of game now which yeah. uses it. but uh... I found it really difficult to jump into from 5e. It took a lot of studying on my part. But I actually have Star Trek The Road Trip. It's over here, <laughs> underneath my munchkins. Well, I, by <laughs> the way, uh, trips, Richard so. is thanking you for being open and uh, showing us your <laughs> flow chart. You find it no extremely problem. interesting. So, but sorry, you were saying. Uh... So, Star Trek Road Trip kind of implements that um, style of 2D20 gameplay. And it has the tokens and everything. So having it visual right in front of you helps. But running it out of the box, a lot of my players had a had difficulty jumping from um, the 5e system, D and D system to the 2d20. So that's something that I think those who love Star Trek and want to play and pick it up should consider. It's a bit of a leap if they're not used to using 2d20. Is it something you would consider writing for Star Trek Adventures, uh, some uh, adventures with a different point of view? Because I find Star Trek in concept is supposed to be very cosmopolitan and very worldwide with influences. You know, you got members of Starfleet who come from all over the world and different planets, but then writers all tend to be from the same country. So seeing materials written from people from uh, Southeast Asia would be actually extremely interesting, I find. Yes, I would love to write for Star Trek. It's one of the shows that I would watch as a kid. Um, my dad was into very specific things when I was younger. Star Trek, Lord of the Rings, and Marvel. <laughs> In particular, his favorite was Thor. Um, he wanted to actually name me Eowyn and Galadriel. Wow. Which my mom quickly vetoed. <laughs> She said it would be too difficult for my family to remember and pronounce, and she was like, she was having none of it. And because my family, in my family, my cousins are um, all named with Spanish names, so oh, wow. she wanted to keep that tradition. Because on my there's oh, on my mom's side, we're Chinese Philip, we're Chinese Filipino, Chinese Filipino and Spanish. So my grandma is. Spanish Filipino, my grandfather's Chinese Filipino. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting. I mean, at the moment, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult topic, so I, I don't want us to, to, to go into that, but I'm listening to some uh, a historical podcast about uh, the very dark chapters of history uh, regarding the, the war in the Pacific and... Uh, and uh, the involvement uh, of the Philippines uh, regarding that, uh, what it was the subject of, is quite uh, well, obviously dreadful, but yes. uh, quite quite interesting and so sadly uh, too too little discussed of. And uh, it, it's really it's really fascinating. I, I, f I find it really interesting to see RPGC being more visible online, and I find it f fascinating also that I. I I guess it's part because uh, English got a a place in terms of vehicular language between all those culture and influences. So it makes it a, a good platform to then engage with the outside world, which happens to use English also as a vehicular language. So, uh, or did you join a RPGC and what's your your involvement uh, with them? And and actually, we're getting closer to to our one hour mark. Uh, what what do you have planned for Session Zero Con? Uh, what are you planning to, to do? Are you running anything there? Or are you just going to be browsing and play stuff or just visit the place? I'm going to 
going to be mainly manning my booth and I really one of the things I really want to do is um, meet new people and you know meet more uh, of those who are part of RPGC and hopefully you know see their projects and everything my sister is going to be my youngest sister is going to be the one running my game oh cool it's her DM debut which wow. I'm so excited she's really nervous for it but I'm so excited like, I know she's going to do a great job um, and I want her to try and really expose her to the D D community. Um, she's a great writer as well, so I hope she meets a lot of people there. We're also going to be showing off one of our new projects, which is called Parthenia Academy. It's a dark academia kind of based project that's set in the modern. It's set in modern times, but you can actually play it in any time period. Um, we accounted for that with the inventory list um so that one is a bit more based on greco-roman and it has more greco-roman inspiration and i'm also lastly going to talk about um a project that has been really close to home it's um an adventure which deals with a one of the Fili um very known philippine universities and the basically the mythological creatures that are very popular here in the Philippines. Amazing. Excellent. So your sister, is that the first time she's DMing or is it the first time she's DMing at a convention? This is, I think it will be the first time she is DMing. Well, this is the first time she'll be DMing with voice. Okay. Definitely. She has a little bit of practice on text for our small group of friends, but this is also the first her first con and her first voice DM. So I'm really excited for her. That's exciting, and that's that's very impressive. Uh, that's quite an endeavor, but uh, hopefully, uh, it will all uh, go uh, very well. Um, where can people find you, and uh, are there dates uh, beyond the one for? Uh, Session zero con that people should remember. I don't know regarding kickstarts, uh, which might I don't know if you already know of an official start date and the the sort of things. Um, you can find me on Twitter. I'm most active on my Twitter, Aki the Writer. Uh, I have a card if um, posted there. If you got, want to reach me through Discord or through my email, uh, I'm. Aside from session zero, I have I'm doing a birthday charity stream on February six. We're going to be doing video games, art, and also a very special D and D game that's going to be hosted by a, a good friend of mine. So that's that's pretty much what I'm doing for this month and next. Awesome. Uh, I will I will check your card and copy paste uh, as many links as possible in the description of the episode. I do include direct links to uh, Midsummer Night's Cream. And uh, actually, if people purchase it, I've got an affiliate code with uh, the Dungeon Masters Guild. So if you purchase it through this link, you will also support the Rollist with a, a modest financial contribution, uh, which at no extra cost. So yeah, uh, people watching this, thank you so much. Richard, you are a faithful viewer. Thank you so much for joining us. Make sure everyone to go check D20 Future Show uh, I believe uh, I mean, he's recorded a lot of episodes, but uh, a favorite of mine is when he plays uh, Jason Statham's Big Vacation, especially when it's at Dragon Meat. So people can check this out. I will link it also in the description of the episode. Uh, people make sure to, to subscribe on that iTunes podcast uh, here on Twitch and uh, on YouTube. And above all, Join us at Session Zero Con, uh, which is, what's the date again? It's in my calendar. But, uh, January 30. January 30. It's uh, free. It's online. It's going to have a, an amazing uh, sort of Pokemon Zelda-like 2D interface for you to navigate the, the convention. So even if you just have uh, half an hour, it's probably going to be very cool to walk around the place and come say hello to Aki and other people uh, on their booth and maybe you run into me uh, as I will be trying to record and stream for there. Uh, thanks Aki again and uh, well, see you at Session Zero Con. Yeah, see you. Thanks, bye.